Well, we want to welcome you guys to the Don't Pass By podcast, but boy, this isn't your average Don't Pass Me By, so you better not pass us by today. Today we have some wonderful guests. They knew some extremely famous people in their own rights. They're very talented people and very accomplished people. And I talk of, of course, of Jude Sutherland Kessler and Ivor Davis and Arthur Schreiber. How could you ask for a better lineup? These guys hit like the 62 Yankees. You just don't want to pitch to them. They're so good. So we want to welcome them to the show. We're going to go back through the sands and time, as they say, in Yellow Submarine. And we're going to talk a lot about an era called the 60s, which left us with so much entertainment, uh, especially musically from these guys and on other levels with fashion trends and politics. What's going on? There's just so much to pick through with this. So I want to say welcome to you three, and thank you for being here. <laughs> Good thank to be you. here. Welcome. We are so excited. I agree with you. This could not be a more prestigious show. It's not me. It's our two guests, Bob, and I'm just honored to be able to co-host with you this one time. Thank you for letting me take part. Letting you take part, au contraire. You <laughs> underestimate your your extreme input into this show. You were definitely, if this was the Ed Sullivan show, you were Ed Sullivan show, but, <laughs> but you're much prettier and smarter than Ed Sullivan. And with all, with all due respect for your husband, Rand, I must say, you're no Aww. Ed Sullivan. So thank so. you very, very much. Well, we are so, I have not been with both Art and Ivor since Beatles at the Ridge. I think it was 2018. Is that right, guys? I think yeah. so. That was, was so much fun. At the time, and I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Ivor is the only person that was our featured author twice, and I think that the good people of Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, would have had Ivor every single year. They, I would ask him, and he would say no because you were without a doubt. When, when y'all took that stage, when you and Art took that stage and told your memories of the 1964 North American tour with the Beatles, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. They were riveted. Thank you. So, Bob, why are we here? Well, Jude, thank you for that prompt. It sounded like you lost me for a second. I guess you were nervous. I know yeah. I'm nervous. I froze there like a, a deer in the headlights for a second. That's how exciting these guests are. But if you all are wondering why we are here, we're all here and we called you here to, to be in this new year, January 2023, believe it or not. And as we look back what the next 12 months will bring, we also want to look back across the span of time of the last 60 years to the landmark year of 1963. Jude and I thought it might be kind of interesting to see what was going on uh, all these decades ago to see how far we've come. And how far we still need to go forward, <laughs> forward. Hopefully, uh, you know, things will get better in this next year for us. We'll see what it holds with its conflicts and problems and challenges and hopefully solution, just as every year does. And every year also has lots of good things to celebrate as well. So, you know, there's football going on, but you all better not be watching it because our show is on. But to kick us off, Jude gave us a five-minute condensed year in review of 1963. So Jude, what are some of the things that made 1963 really, really special? Well, I had to call Bob. Well, I first texted him in the middle of the night, and then I called him first thing this morning and said, I keep writing 50 years ago, and I guess it's because I don't really understand how I can be talking about what happened 60 years ago when I'm not 60. I, I, I can't figure that one out, but for some reason I seem to, <laughs> to remember it at all. But um, now, Ivor and Art, you guys jump in anytime you want to add to this, but one thing that I remember about 63 was on Sunday nights, my family all had to gather in their, our little t tiny pine uh, board-lined TV room to watch this new hit TV show that was starring the Cartwright family. And, of course, it was Bonanza, and we loved it, and my sister and I even made up words to the instrumental theme song. That's how much we loved it. And then on Friday nights, and Ivor, I'm going to ask you about this, there was this brand new political satire that was called That Was the Week That Was. Wasn't that uh, started in England to begin with? 
it did start in England, and it, it started with a bunch of university students. I think they were all from Oxford and Cambridge, or maybe it was just Cambridge. But there was characters like David Frost, and everybody remembers David Frost because he went on to become a, a marvelous, marvelous interviewer. And he had his own program, and he was kind of the, well, I don't know, I won't say the Ed Murrow, but certainly he was, he was the Barbara Waters, if you like, of his period. But that was the week that was, of course, um, was very, very, very funny because they, they took the mickey out of anybody, and nobody was beyond being battered to death. So that was that was the week that was, and it was a great show. It was, it was, I was, you know, I, I guess I was like nine years old, so I didn't understand all of it, but a lot of it, you know, I could catch, and it was really funny, and I loved it. And then one of my favorite movies of 1963 was a chance to see Jerry Lewis in a role I had never seen him in before, and that was the Nutty Professor, um, because he in there, he would drink this potion, and he would end up being this kind of cool guy that he probably was in real life. And Bob, you're the movie aficionado. You have any comments about the Nutty Professor? And, and anything that came out from the Disney studios in those days was definitely high class, high end family entertainment. Um, you know, how can you go wrong, how can you go wrong with such a cast, um, and movie, which today, you know, they, you can't buy it in the bargain bin. You have to go shell out like twenty nine ninety nine for it. So that should speak for itself, but it is a classic. It came out of that era. It's a, a perfect piece of, uh, you know, piece of the cinema to, uh, to exemplify that era. Yeah, yeah, you know your movies. If y'all ever get a chance to listen to more of um, Don't Pass Me By, Bob has done some wonderful interviews with um, Gregory Peck's son, and they and talking Tony about, Peck, Tony, and then and tell us about the book that you um, also covered in your podcast where you talked about Brando and Peck. Well, what happened with that one, Jude, was um, I I'd always been a fan of Brando as well because I like The Godfather and I know uh, I can't compete with Ivor in the movies Ivor is uh, Ivor's a regular Leonard Malton plus but um, there was a book out called Marlon and Greg and um, it was written by a fellow named Joe Bratzman, Bear Matter Media and uh, is the publisher and uh, I, I love Peck so much and his movies have meant so much to me that I uh, saw in their catalog some friends with their their, uh, their owner Ben Omar, um, I said, hey, how about sending me a copy of that and I'd have this guy on a podcast, not knowing that this was Tony Peck's best friend. So I had no, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to go higher on the rung in the ladder. I said, hey, this guy wrote a book. It's probably pretty good. You know, let me check it out. If he'll come on, we'll have some fun. I thought he was your average boob, just like me sitting around watching the telly. So uh, I got a call from Joe Brutzman. He couldn't have been nicer. And I didn't know he'd written his own movies. Uh, you know, so that that had been on the large silver screen is it still still silver ivor and he came on did a great is. show I think it is, uh, yeah. <laughs> still silver well silver's going up in prices so that's a good yeah, thing. nobody nobody goes to the movies anymore they all watch it on the telly but go ahead bob <laughs> thank you thank you for that insight from my good friend ivor davis and he helps me out when i get stuck on movie questions but I actually called him and I got scared uh joe came on and then through uh inter interviewing mr brutzman he said to me, do you want me to bring my friend on next time? And I said, your friend? Who's your friend? He said, Tony Peck, Tony Peck being Gregory Peck's son. So I called Ivor for, to instill some confidence in me. And uh, then Ivor ended up uh, interviewing uh, Mr. Brutzman. And Ivor is setting up to do, uh, we don't have a date set yet, but Mr. Peck was kind enough to say he'll come on yet again. And uh, the person he wants to dig in and speak to is our good friend, Lennon Malton sort of Ivor Davis. Isn't that something? Wow. That is it. That show was fantastic. I, I recommend everybody listen to it. I'm not a huge movie buff because the initials I live by are NNW, which is never not working. So I rarely take time off from being at this computer, but he got me so interested in it. I started watching some Brando films and some Peck movies and really getting into it. And Bob, where can people go if they want to listen to that? Well, these days they could go on Podbean. If you just put in um, uh, Bob Wilson, don't pass me by 
and uh, Gregory, and just put Peck in, P-E-C-K, that up. the shows will show up. Or if you okay. put in Bob Wilson, don't pass me by, you could choose a show. I didn't mean to go on about it. I hope we're not on a strict timeline because if you bring up Gregory Peck, I, you know, I just can't stop myself. But Ivor was great when he came on with those interviews. I just got out of the way because they were like two pros. It was like Tom Seaver for the Mets pitching back in the day against Bob Gibson of the Cardinals. Those two guys were too, wow. too, too hard to top even for the best of them. I love it. Well, there was another movie that year, but this one my parents didn't let me go see, and it starred a good friend of Ivers, the lovely, voluptuous Elizabeth Taylor. Have any comment, Art or Iver? Yes. Uh, in fact, when I became bureau chief and went to London to visit my first bureau, we had a bureau in London, uh, I got to go to the set and meet Brando and uh, Liz Taylor. Mm. Yeah, that that was uh, a little after what we were going to talk about uh, with the Beatles in 63 and 64. Ivor and you too, probably Bob and, and Jude, uh, you were able to talk about the Beatles in 63. I didn't know anything about the Beatles in 63 uh, because I was covering uh, the riot in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, it, it was very, very difficult. Uh, the the uh, riots for civil rights were really all over the country at that time. Yeah. And um, and that was what I was assigned to at the time and had no idea about these young guys that were going to appear on the Ed Sullivan show and later that Ivor Davids and Arch Schreiber would be uh, traveling with them. Yeah. Yeah, and and I were you in '63. You didn't really know much about them either, did you? No, believe it or not, I didn't. I'd heard about them. They were uh, don't forget communications worldwide was not that good. When I wanted to learn something, it was either on the radio, and they didn't have the internet, of course. But but what but what I loved about meeting Mr. Schreiber who lives now in deepest, darkest uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I liked about him was that, that when I met him, he didn't want to talk about music. He just wanted to talk about politics because he got, he got dragged kicking and screaming from the important stories to things like four frivolous lads coming to America. And Arthur, you were, you were, you were immersed in politics what did you, I mean, can I ask, what the hell did you think was happening when they said, leave polit politics and go and join the Fab Four? <laughs> well, the, the, the funny part about that, Ivor, is, is that, you know, when I, one day I came back from lunch, this is in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was news director for a big Westinghouse station of 50,000 watt radio station called KYW. Today, it's located in Philadelphia. Well, and it was in Philadelphia before it went to Cleveland. But then I uh, uh, finished lunch, and I stopped in on my way back to the newsroom at KYW. I stopped in the, the program director's office. And uh, all the disc jockeys were sitting around the perimeter of the room, the music director, the public affairs director, everybody seemed to me was jammed into the program director's office. And I said, what's wrong? And a voice answered, WHK got the Beatles. And that <laughs> WHK is our major competitor in Cleveland. It was a New York-based radio station, Metro Media. And uh, 
they had bid on the Beatles and won the bid. And I don't know what possessed me. I didn't know anything about music, as Ivor knows and other people know. I looked at the program director and I said, why don't you put me on the Beatles tour? And they jumped up and ran into the manager's office and then, and it all went from there. <laughs> so I had volunteered, but I didn't know what I was volunteering for <laughs> yeah, until really. I got there. I mean, you literally, and, and we need to do another show if we can twist Bob's arm into having us all back. But we, we could do a show about what happened in 64 and follow up on our 63 show because, Art, if I'm not mistaken, in Dallas, you literally had your shirt and coat ripped off your back by the fans, right? Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. In fact, in fact, I I kept track. I lost three suits, three <laughs> tape recorders, uh, uh, two typewriters, and a few other things on that tour. Good grief! That. And talk about the, that song, Fly Into the Danger Zone. I mean, you guys, you, you were both in the danger zone for sure. But I'm going to toss out one more thing and get you to guys to react to this because there was another rising star that was going to end up meeting John Lennon in 1964. But in 1963, she was undercover, as it were. She wasn't under a lot of cover. But her name was Gloria Steinem, and she was posing as a bunny and the Playboy Bunny Club to do an expose on what these beautiful, voluptuous young girls were being asked to do in order to increase liquor sales. And she ended up publishing uh, that article, and she went on to become one of the front runners of the feminist movement. Did either of you ever talk with Gloria Steinem or know her, or what's your impression of her? Well, I, I did meet her, and I've talked to her many times, but let me tell you that I was assigned to the Democratic and Republican conventions, political conventions of 1964, and our company, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, had hired Betty Friedan. Uh, do you remember Betty Friedan? She uh, she eclipsed Gloria Steinem. She was older, and she was one of the very early women who fought for women's rights, like Gloria uh, Steinem and, and, of course, Betty Friedan. And it was a pleasure. I was assigned to edit her copy to make sure that her timing was right and that she, uh, her, all her uh, excerpts that were going on Westinghouse were done correctly. And it was a great pleasure in being able to meet Betty Friedan. Yeah, her, what was her book, The Feminine Mystique? Well, I can't remember what the name of her title was, but she, yeah, she was, Betty Friedan is the ultimate leader of the feminist movement, and uh, Gloria Steinem played a large role, but man, you were you were dealing with the number one top dog there. That's right, and, and uh, you know, uh, she wrote, I don't know how many books, but there were quite a few, uh, and, and uh, then, in fact, uh, she did not live much longer after uh, the 1964 uh, Democratic Convention. Yeah, now, can I either... just add, add something? Can I add yeah. something to what Arthur just said? Sure. Um, um, strangely enough, I'm currently in Pasadena, California, at the Television Critics of America, um, annual conference and I would say Arthur that 12 years ago your lessons to Gloria Steinem on how to deliver and speak powerfully went was very worthwhile because when I met her 10-12 years ago 
she was promoting one of her books and they had just done a documentary about her life. I can't remember which network. She was an absolute stunner. She was beautiful, of course, when she put the bunny tail on and she was still beautiful in middle age. And she absolutely had us entranced telling her story and what a story that was. And um, yeah. I mean, Betty Friedan was a bit like, um, I would say, my grandmother. I don't remember. <laughs> Gloria, I mean, with all due respect uh, to Betty, um, but Gloria was kind of a glamour girl, wasn't she? Oh, yes. And, and there was friction between Gloria Steinem and, and Betty Friedan. Well, uh, two big leaders, quite, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, but Betty Friedan was so much older, and uh, just uh, it was, a, a, again, a different era when she was growing up and then tried to start the, her, uh, you, you know, helping women was totally different than when Gloria Steinem was doing. Yeah. Well, now, Ivor, uh, you actually crossed cross paths with Gloria Steinem on another very memorable occasion. I don't know if you actually got to see her, but the night that you were at the Riviera uh, Idlewild, uh, the last night of the 1964 tour when something else very famous happened, as you, you have been kind enough to tell me about when Bob Dylan finally appeared. But earlier that evening, Gloria Steinem was there because she came to sit down and talk to John. Did you get to talk to her that night? Well, uh, I did not get a chance to talk to Gloria, but I believe what had happened was on the night of the last night of the tour of 1964, and Jude really knows it from A to Z, um, there was a charity event in downtown New York. Uh, and, um, and that's where Steinem and a bunch of other celebrities got to meet the Beatles. Now, I cannot remember whether Gloria came to the hotel uh, after, the, after the concert. All I do remember is that uh, Brian Epstein and Derek Taylor Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, and Derek Taylor, the PR guy of the Beatles, got into a terrible, terrible row, and, and Derek w marched out on, uh, on, on Brian and then came back to the fold years later. So uh, I can't specifically say that, uh, that I was, uh, uh, I was the, uh, the fly on the wall when Gloria and John got together. But, Jude, you will attest to this. Whenever there was a beautiful lady around, John was very um, communicative, wasn't he? <laughs> he was. It's, it's funny, though, because I think it took two ingredients for John. I mean, there were lots of gorgeous girls that I'm sure were after him all the time, but he was always drawn to not only the beautiful but the smart. I mean, he, he had a thing for John Baez, um, for... Ronnie Spector, they didn't, he, he wasn't just looking for beautiful, but he was looking for beautiful and smart. And Gloria Steinem certainly had those qualities. So, I mean, gosh, there's so many, so many incredible things of 1963. And I'll throw out one more thing, and then we're going to talk serious politics. But in Detroit in 63, there was a, a relatively new record company that was just emerging under the auspices of this entrepreneur named Barry Gordy. He had great stars that he was promoting. One was Marvin Gaye, the other was Smokey Robinson. And this, I mean, you talk about the American dream. Um, this young boy growing up, loving music, wanting to promote music stars. And from that, Motown arose. So either one of you remember anything about that from 63? No, I, I, I do not uh, know anything about that. And I must add to what Arthur just said. I mean, we followed it with some interest, but it wasn't, don't forget, it was an emerging, that whole Motown stuff was emerging as a new wave. And so the new wave didn't hit California until a few years later. And then we realized, wow, that's the Motown sound. So uh, we plead, uh, and maybe I, I don't want to plead ignorance uh, on behalf of Arthur, because Arthur knows everything. Uh, but I do plead ignorance and, and say thank you for that question. I can't, I can't tell you anymore. 
<laughs> well, the, here are the last few things, Bob, and then it's all yours. But 63, we got this thing called a zip code. It was a five-digit zip code. And I remember my parents griping and griping about it, having to add that on to the address. Now we think nothing of it. Most of the U.S. cities in America in 63 decided to fluorinate their water because they found out that it would prevent tooth decay. And Chevrolet had had this loser of a car that they designed in the late 1950s. Nobody would buy it. Across the country, only 350 cars a year were sold. So in 1963, they redesigned this loser car, the Corvette, and they made it into what they called the Stingray. And that year, they sold 10,000 hardtops and 10,000 convertibles. And they knew they had hit something big. And finally, um, 63, President Kennedy got to do what I've dreamed of doing all my life. And I hope that maybe, maybe, maybe I'm going to get to do this year, 60 years later, after he did it. But he got to go to his family's homeland of Ireland and find out about his family's roots. And I'm glad he got to do that because, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, little did he know that that was his last year with us. So um, it was a bucket list item, and it was a dream come true for him. So, Bob, that's it. 1963's events kind of in a nutshell. Yes, ma'am. Well, Ivor Davis, 1963, you were quite the busy bee. Uh, of course, you're, you've been a respected journalist prior to and after that up until this very day. Foreign correspondent and all. Uh, Well-traveled. You've been in all these special places when things happen. I jokingly call you Zelig. But just when I think, Ivar, you've thrown me at the last curveball so I can look for a fastball. It's our baseball jog for you soccer hooligans. <laughs> you always throw me another one. I don't know. You have so many in your bag of tricks that I'm jealous. Just when I think that's got to be his last one, he comes up with another one. But you, I want to start with 63 by saying you met someone I didn't know that you had met, and I can get into a couple of the details, but I want to hear your, your version of this first before I, I drone on about any of that. Someone who had been mentioned in the name with the Kennedys and uh, the Vietnam War and all the goings on over there, the Golden Triangle and such, which was the heroin trade, you seem to have met someone unless you were pulling my leg, and I don't believe you were, sir. Um, you, you've you actually met the Dragon Lady of South Vietnam. You know of whom I speak, sir? Yes, I do. Um, you've got to realize that 1963, as we all know, was an unbelievably tumultuous year. I mean, the Vietnam War was in full swing. Every night we would stay home and turn on the television and we would get the latest the newscasters announcing the latest tragic body bag count of American servicemen killed. It was a pretty rotten, rough year, really. And, of course, uh, the, the, over, the, the government of Vietnam was overthrown. Uh, Madame Nu was the tiger lady. She was the uh, unofficial first lady of Vietnam. Uh, her husband... Can I call her the dragon lady? The dragon lady. We call her the dragon lady from now on. Um, but, but, but what actually happened was, and it was turmoil there, and, and, and the amazing thing was, um, and, I, and, and I only thought about this when I saw Jude's little note, and then I suddenly thought, wow, that was a, a period of such turmoil. Uh, Vietnam was in a mess. Uh, people were dying. Uh, young soldiers were dying. And Madame Nu shows up in... Uh, October of 1963 in Beverly Hills, California. Now, what the heck was she doing in Beverly Hills, California? And I'll tell you what I discovered. She had come over after the disaster of what had happened. You know, her, her husband, her brother-in-law were assassinated in Vietnam. She came over. She wanted to, to whiplash uh, the American government for allowing it to happen, and that's what she said. And so I discovered she was holed up in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, which is a very Tony hotel in Beverly Hills. And so I went along to the hotel, and we were waiting to see her. Now, I must tell you that she did not stop to give me an interview, but I did see her. She was with her 18-year-old daughter, 
can't remember the name. And I discovered, uh, doing a little digging around, why was she, after this terrible assassination of her family, doing in Beverly Hills? And the answer to the question was, she was getting a facelift Ooh. in Beverly Hills, believe it or not. And so she tried to dodge us. Yes. We were all kind of standing in the, in the corridors of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And every time she whizzed by with her face actually kind of masked almost, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So there she was doing interviews on national television, bad-mouthing America because of what they, she perceived they did and killed her, her husband and her brother-in-law. And this was October. And could, would you believe November 1963, John Kennedy is assassinated weeks later. So wow. I was thinking because, sorry to go on so long, and, and, and I'll, I'll shut up. In it's a fascinating. Please don't yeah. cut Bob, the time on this yeah, one. This yeah. is fascinating. So, and I'd like to hear what Arthur has to say. Bob, you are a conspiracy expert. Um, then, and then I didn't realize... Don't jinx me with the expert bet. I'll make a mistake in no time. <laughs> Just, we'll, we'll, say I'm, we'll say I'm, exactly. I'm kind of well-versed. The question I have for you, Bob, knowing, knowing what you know about the Kennedy assassination is, has there been a school of thought that Madame New might have been behind the murder and assassination in, in November 1963 of John Kennedy? Yes, um, there is a school of thought of that, um, as you guys would know, and, and you probably reported on it, uh, prompt maybe even extensively. You know, the heroin trade, the heroin triangle was there. And um, they said when um, John Kennedy, there had been quotes at the time that um, the agency was out of control. And, uh, you know, Kennedy's own historian, Arthur Schlesinger, had said later in an interview something that made me sort of jostle in my seat. He said Kennedy had been at war with the intelligence services and most of it had been over Vietnam. So uh, just after learning uh, the DM brothers, you know, who you had mentioned were uh, Madam, Madam News, uh, you know, husband and brother-in-law, were murdered, they said Kennedy was shaken and turned, you know, ghost white because he hadn't ordered the assassination. Now, someone might say, well, he did order it, and this was all propaganda. You can go back and forth on that, but they, uh, Kennedy died two weeks later, <laughs> and, and our policy to Vietnam seems to have changed quite a bit towards the more aggressive towards the war. So, you know, um, people can say conspiracy theory, and, you know, it makes things look silly, which you weren't doing, but I'm just saying that was quite a chain of events there that, that changed our future. So, yes, there was indeed. It had to do with the heroin trade. Um, and one might wonder, I don't know if she had gotten back by the time uh, by, the, by the time her husband had been killed. I believe he was killed when she was out of the country. And one might wonder skeptically if that was by design because they didn't want her in the country when those two murders took place. So more interesting than my... My musings on that is, let's go over to Arthur. And Arthur, do you want to jump in on any of that or 1963 in general or do you any memories on President Kennedy? Well, uh, well, yes. Uh, I, I uh, of course, covered the funeral uh, and, uh, and also was... Uh, I arrived at Washington that night uh, because I, they wanted me to be at Andrews Air Force Base when the uh, Air Force One arrived with the pres new president, uh, Lyndon Johnson. And, of course, Jackie was uh, there uh, on that plane uh, with, with the body. And uh, when she, I'll always remember her getting off the plane uh, had that beautiful pink suit on, and it was spattered with uh, J uh, with uh, John's blood. Uh, that was a, uh, and I I covered the funeral. Then uh, had to go uh, to the briefings 
of uh, Pierre Salinger uh, was the press secretary, and he was doing the briefings. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you will uh, you ought to know that I have now since uh, all this time, just in the last few months, I met a historian. I uh, haven't met him in person yet. I've only talked to him on the phone. Um, and he's a historian in uh, New Jersey. And he, uh, uh, I was telling him the story of my being assigned to the Capitol Rotunda, where, if you remember, uh, Jackie and Caroline, who was, what, five years older. So uh, the two of them walked in, walked to the catafalque, and the flag-draped catafalque was there, and they both knelt, and Jackie urged Caroline, and Caroline picked up a piece of, of the flag and kissed it, and I I lost it. I could not continue to describe what was going on. I wasn't the only one of the many correspondents who were describing what was happening. Many broke up, including my friend Walter Cronkite, and uh, and the, the producer was screaming in my ear, send it back here, send it back here. Well, I said this is Ann Corrick with Art Schreiber at the Capitol Rotunda. Now, that's what I thought I said. And when I got back to the office, I was really chided by saying that I had identified myself as Ann Corrick, who was a colleague of mine, uh, one of our correspondents, and she and I covered the rotunda. I did not know until this historian, Al, uh, and now I'm missing his last name, Asa, Jason, Jason, I think it was Al Jason. Uh, yeah. Yes, he listened to my. Uh, it's on somewhere on the inter internet. He listened to my broadcast, and I did not make a mistake. I did identify myself as Arch Schreiber, and I'm grateful that all these years I thought I had made a mistake and I find out that I didn't. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you've been a can legend just, and uh, just, absolutely, I ever continue. Yeah, I just want to weigh in with a question to Arthur. That's a very, very emotional time and it evokes, well, I, I mean, we were all much younger then. Um, what I wondered, and, and, and this is the problem with history, is when you're living history, you don't realize you're living history. So I wondered, getting back to this Madame Nu thing and, and Vietnam, and was Vietnam getting revenge, or was it the Cubans, or was it who was it? Arthur, at any stage during your political career and your career in, in broad, your tremendous career in broadcasting, did, the, did, did anything ever pop up saying it was uh, Madame Nu and, and, and the Vietnam uh, uh, getting their revenge on? On, on John Kennedy. I mean, we know about the Cuban conspiracy suggestions. Did you ever hear any of that at the time or only yes. later? Yes, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories, as you all know, uh, immediately following the assassination. What was, and maybe Bob knows this, uh, Jude uh, being uh, you New Orleans people, uh, there was the conspiracy theory that started out in New Orleans, and it 
dealt with the uh, district attorney. Was it at the district attorney or with the federal Jim attorney? Garrison. Jim Garrison, yeah, Jim Garrison. Uh, that's right. Now, that became a very huge story. And and it started out that night in, in fr- from New Orleans, but it immediately spread to the to the world, uh, as well as obviously to the United States, and uh, I and I I think today of you know this was in the days of no computers no cell phones, uh, and certainly no uh, social media. Think what it would have been today with in today's environment. Yeah. yeah. yeah can I, I'm sorry, you know, we're going off, off course. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Bob, and I'm sorry, Jude. Oh, no, I love Don't it. Don't apologize to yeah. Bob. You're rolling into my waters. We know that Jude is the John Lennon expert of the world, but as you go into Jim Garrison, you shall hear no complaints from me, sir. No, I love it. I, I love it. Yeah, well, I'm, we are off key, and we probably need another five hours to, to get back on course. But, <laughs> but, 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 but <laughs> Arthur, Arthur mentions Jim Garrison, and I remember vividly, I think it must have been 64, because I got a call from my London office, and they said, get over to New Orleans, because Jim Garrison has solved the Kennedy assassination. Well, my God. Uh, so I raced down to New Orleans, and he was having a press conference. And so I went along to the hotel, I think, I forget the name of it, and there Jim Garrison was there, and I introduced myself to Jim Garrison, and he started on, a, 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 I mean, it, it was kind of bizarre. He kept saying, you've come all the way from England to interview me. I thought, he's a bit off center. I came all the way from California to hear you tell me who killed Kennedy. And anyway, so he went on. He did blether on a bit. And there are people who think he was fantastic. And I think Oliver Stone, the filmmaker, thinks he was fantastic. Um, so I was a little bit unimpressed with this man who had the, the world at his fingertips to tell us who did it. And it was, there was Clay Shaw and all the uh, New Orleans crowd. So I, I, I was a bit off of Jim Garrison because he didn't seem to be focused. And, and, and I, I don't know what any of you others have to say about this. Might I ask kindly to Jude, can it, with your permission, yeah. Might I go a little bit into this with Ivor, and, and yeah, you, I'll yeah. put a hook in my mouth, and any time you want to reel me in, I shall not resist. Let, let me suggest this, because we are at 541, and um, Art asked me if there's any way that we can conclude in 45 minutes, and I think, if it's okay with, with all of you, we should break this into two, maybe three shows. Bob, would that be okay with you if we did that? Because, I'm a, I'd like to give a, li, a little re, short rebut then if, no, if we're no, going to do yeah. it later, sure. No, I think But I should, won't go off on a tangent, and if I do, you can all club me. No, no, I'm saying let's talk about whatever <laughs> we want to, and then we'll reconvene on another day. I'll break. I mean, let, let's keep on sure. going with this is what I'm saying. If, if that's okay with y'all, let's keep on going with this. Okay, Bob, roll. I, I do not mean to presume I, to be in the league with Ivor or Arthur or Jude. Even yeah. if we took the Beatles, Jude Supremes, me and these two guys with the news certainly know more than I do. I have spent quite a bit of time looking into Mr. Jim Garrison, and I've interviewed people who were um, at the side of the car when Kennedy was killed. I've interviewed a Secret Service agent. Um, so let's just say I've done about 30 interviews on it of people who are not extremely distanced from it. Going back to... Garrison, um, I'm sure what Ivor saw and heard from Garrison was quite on target. I do not doubt that if I was Ivor's assistant that day carrying his briefcase, we would have gone out of the place and I might have agreed wholeheartedly with his estimation of, of Mr. Garrison. The things that happened in the background, though, are quite um, interesting. One being Garrison's two Top, two of the top witnesses were named David Ferry and Eladio Del Valle. David Ferry had been from the New Orleans group 
uh, the supposedly involved in this. Eladio Del Valle had been a high Cuban uh, politician who came over and fought with the exiles. As the case broke in the news, uh, they both died within two weeks, I believe is a fair estimation. Uh, David Ferry committed suicide. Then they said he died of natural causes. He left two uh, typed unsigned suicide notes. Hmm. I think that's a little bit strange. Eladio Del Valle had a more natural death. I kid. He was, uh, in any respect, going out to his family. I, I, I mean no dispersion. It was just he's, his head was split open with a machete, and he was shot above the heart. Wow. Uh, that happened within two weeks of the case coming out. So these were the witnesses that JF, uh, the Dave, boy, I'm a mess here, uh, that Jim Garrison was going after to speak to. Later, the man in charge of the New Orleans operation, allegedly, Clay Shaw, he was found innocent. He was found innocent quite quickly, except the jury did say they did believe that there was a conspiracy, just not that it was proven that Clay Shaw was involved in it. To wrap it up, Clay Shaw was later proven to be a high-paid intelligence asset for the agency. Uh, when he said he was not a member of the agency, that was not true. Um, in those ca- in a case such as that, that's perjury, which Garrison wanted to charge him with, and then by getting the perjury conviction, he might have gotten him to talk. That was uh, the charge was you know basically a, a good district attorney going you know saying we want to have a grand jury. They wouldn't allow it. This could be because the only argument could be because he was in the intelligence uh, field. You know, if, if he had lied about anything else, there would be no protection. Um, I don't believe New Orleans was the hub of the assassination had it occurred and have, if it was a conspiracy, let's say. But what it would have been is Oswald, who was a Marine defector over to the Soviet Union, and then uh, came back to the United States uh, charged with no crime, not charged with uh, betraying his country, Uh, supposedly at first not even debriefed. I got back in the country and got a job with uh, Jager Child Stovall, which made uh, top-secret maps for places like Cuba. So these are not normal people or circumstances. And, you know, one of the autopsy doctors, to wind this down, um, Thomas Boswell, was asked in the 90s for the Assassination Records Review Board, and I was able to speak to one of the men who was there when he drew a diagram of Kennedy's head and described it. And he said, and you can see the diagram, he drew Kennedy's head with a fist size missing from the back of his occipital parietal part of his head. Now, he was at the autopsy. At the hospital itself at Parkland, 14 doctors and nurses, at least the number might have been 17, all described a similar wound the size of a fist being missing from Kennedy's occipital parietal, the back right part of his head. It's quite hard to, I would think in a court of law, to um, fight all those facts, but we'll never know because Oswald was killed killed on television three days later. So thank you for letting me go on. We could even (laughs) edit some of this or we could put it in with the three shows. But when we talk about them, I spent, I started, uh, researching this at 19 i'm 50 i'm now 58 i'll be 58 in july and uh i don't even know my own age so why believe me about anything folks nothing (laughs) but uh but uh no there are if you talk to the witnesses and you talk to the people that were there and i took a chance as a youngster i believe i was still a teenager and i wrote to uh colonel fletcher proudy who i've mentioned uh, mr ivor davis before in in conversation when he'd let me drone on and I just asked him what happened. Now, his job was the number two man in the United States in black ops, black ops being um, committing murders in other countries for good reason. Someone's a bad guy. They're coming after America. Someone has to go. They go to the guys in black ops. When Kennedy was killed, he, I said, I saw your name on a document, and please forgive me if I've written to you and it's inappropriate. And he sent me back an eight-page letter, one of several. So he car- took mercy and corresponded with me. And he told me, you know, and I looked it up and researched that was his job. As a matter of fact, he had quite many, uh, his pre- his funeral looked presidential. I'd seen film of his funeral as well. Um, it was an immense event. So this guy was somebody. And uh, he said he was sent out of the country to New Ze- Christchurch, New Zealand, um, on a job he would never usually be asked to do to show dignitaries the locale. So he wasn't in the country when Kennedy was killed, and he 
wrote and said he bought a newspaper, which he had saved, and he uh, was kind enough to make some Xeroxes for me. And uh, they already had all the information about Oswald in the newspaper, and we have two journalists here, and we have, you know, Jude's a journalist. She's an author, though, with the newspapers. And they said, he said, I went back to the Pentagon and asked my friends, you know, could they have had all this information in New Zealand at this time to have a biographical, you know, write up on Oswald coming back from Russia and, you know, this photograph of him, a studio portrait and all this. And the conclusion the Pentagon came up uh, for Prouty was no. And as a person who did that for a living, which means he was in the business of overthrowing governments and, you know, assassinations, um, I found him to be an honorable man who, the kind of man, if we have to trust with jobs like that, the kind of guy you would want to be in that kind of a position. But he felt, uh, he felt quite certain. He said, if we were going to do something like this, it would have looked exactly like this cover story. And he believed none of the official story, to say the least. So if wow. I was with Mr. Davis in that office and saw Mr. Garrison at that point in time, I may, have, may also have come out with Ivor, who's smarter than I am. Uh, I were lucky with that, but you know he's a brilliant man and a good friend, and I have so much respect for him. I kid with him, but uh, you know he's he's met so many famous people and done such great work. But uh, as it shakes out, if you really look at the details, the medical evidence at Parkland Hospital, the medical evidence at the autopsy, um, you know they don't hold up. They found a piece of occipital parietal bone called the Harper fragment in Dealey Plaza, which is the back of your head. And the back of a head for the audience missing means that you were shot from the front and the larger wound would be in the back of your head. But as for Mr. Garrison, I don't think, I think he was fighting against the tidal wave swimming against it. And although he might not have been confused with St. Francis by any stretch of the imagination, I do think he was on to something. Yeah, and let me add, Bob, that you and Ivor did an interesting uh, podcast in December, and for uh, our listeners, it's on Don't Pass Me By. It's December uh, 2022, and you and Ivor are talking with, with M William Matson Law about this very topic, about the Kennedy assassination, and also I think you talk about Robert Kennedy as well. So if people are really interested in this, they need to hear that, Don't Pass Me By, podcast as well. Well, Arthur's probably saying, why was Bob here? My God, he didn't say a word and forgive me, Arthur. But Ivor was also at the assassination scene of Robert Kennedy. And of all things, we talked about getting your shirt and clothes ripped off at a Beatles concert. Sergeant Shriver ripped off Ivor's shirt at Robert Kennedy's assassination. So Jiminy Crickets, these two gentlemen have been so esteemed and been in so many. Ivor, you guys are something. Well, Ivor? Yes, I'm still here. Yes, I'm, I'll be, I mean, I, I'm mesmerized. What I suggest we do, and I, I mean, I'm, I, it's always good to, to talk to you, uh, Arthur and, and Jude, and, you know, we, we, we could go on all night, but I'll just leave you with one thought. Um, I love, I, I mean, Bob has done phenomenal research. Bob, I, I believe that. But let's maybe talk about was Charles Manson a tool of the CIA? So, I mean, that's... Sure. <laughs> sure. We, you know, we, we, I think we should hand over to Jude. We, let's hand over to Jude and let her pull things back together. <laughs> I love hey, it. Hey, Jude. <laughs> I think it's hugely important. And, Ivor, I don't know what your uh, time constrictions are. Can we talk about Dr. King and, and civil rights, or do you need to... Uh, are we coming up on the time limit for you? Well, I, I, I've actually got to go back to a, a, an interview at four o'clock my time. Okay. I, I mean, I mean, this. I know Jude prepared enormously as she does, and this is her impeccability <laughs> when she does these programs. And we haven't covered probably we, we, we've covered only thirty nine percent of what we were going to talk about. Yes. So, uh, what I was going to suggest was, as Jude suggested, and as Bob seemed to agree, and and Arthur's always. Ready, ready to give us his fantastic opinion. Maybe we can do this another time. Okay, we're going to put a we'll put a line under Kennedy, and we will be ready next time to talk about the civil rights movement, which will be a discussion all in itself, and um, you know what was going on in Washington D.C. when Johnson is made the next president of the United States and what his impact was, and then maybe we want to do a third 
show and talk about the Beatles and their emergence in 1963, which leads into both of you being on the 1964 tour. Bob, would that be okay with you? Could you stand us for two more shows? I just want to apologize. When you bring up the Kennedy assassination, please understand that when I learned Ivor was at the Robert Kennedy assassination and he met Jim Garrison and that his shirt was torn off at Robert's assassination, I've studied this almost every day for 40 years. And usually on the podcast, I don't know what else will, I know Arthur won't believe this, but I'm usually accused of being too quiet and I try to get the guest to speak. I think Ivor will back me up as a witness on this one, ironically. Yeah, and yeah. usually I talk, the, I talk the least and I try to get, I feature everyone else. But when you bring up Jim Garrison and I've interviewed many of his friends and the witnesses and these things and Secret Service agent and uh, people who were at the autopsy, I can't believe when I look back, some of these people spoke to me. They gave me, you know, very gracious, but I didn't mean to filibuster. I oh, we loved it. Set my, the stars of the show after Jude, of course, with her, you know, number one work on Landon were Jude and Arthur, and I did not mean to hog the microphone. I just hope you'll understand it was my zeal of how I much think, time I've spent I think we all loved it. This. this was a great discussion about Kennedy and the assassination. And, then, and my esteem for all of you is, great and I'm so happy you were here and that I know the other two shows would be fantastic and I'm more than on board but I apologize for hogging the microphone today. Oh, we loved I, it. We uh, loved it. Well, before we go because I know that Ivor needs to get to his interview but I do want to say thank you. Um, Art, your wonderful book Out of Sight is available still and you can get it on Amazon. And we'll talk about why he named his book Out of Sight. And I believe the subtitle is And Feeling All Right. Is that correct, Arthur? Yes. Uh, but uh, I'd just like to mention, Bob, I think that was a very fascinating and interesting uh, part that you played tonight that was very, very valuable for people to hear and the way you described it was very well done. It was. It well, was you're very cool. gracious gracious to me, and I, I thank you for putting up with it, and my esteem for you is great, and my respect for you, and I would never, if I had my wits about me, ever try to talk more on a show than you at when we get, we're so fortunate to have you come on. It's just when that subject comes up, yeah, uh, Jude had to put me in a Hannibal Lecter mask and <laughs> mouth guard. To keep me quiet. It. So, this, I'm so glad you were here, and I'm glad we'll do it again. And I hope I haven't in any way been disrespectful. I didn't mean to be. It's just when you bring that subject up, it's like you wind me up and let me go like one of those well, toys we, that flies across the floor. We loved it, loved it, loved it. And Ivor, thank you for being here. I know you're at a convention. You got to go, but everybody, check out Ivor's amazing book, The Beatles and Me on Tour, which is available wherever fine books are sold. It it tells you the true story. There are a lot of myths about the 1964 tour, but Ivor was the only journalist to be there from day one to day end. Other people, because of prior commitments, hopped on and off the tour because they were covering other things politically, such as Art, who was covering the Democratic National Convention. But Ivor was there for the whole thing. He straightens out the myth of when the Beatles took marijuana for the first time. It is a huge myth, and he straightens it out. You don't want to miss his book, The Beatles and Me on Tour, as well as his very esteemed book, Manson Exposed, the true story of Charles Manson and what happened. And for your children, a great book called Ladies and Gentlemen, The Penguins. So, Bob, thank you for letting all of us join you, and I turn it over to you to say goodbye. Well, we just want to say thank you so much to our esteemed guests. I'm so excited that they would come back. Jude Kessler is the greatest expositor on John Lennon that there is out there. And Art and Ivor, um, what can be said? You were there. You covered these things as they happened. You're legends. Um, it's fascinating to listen to you. Uh, as they say in Beetle Land, it's certainly a thrill. And I look so much forward to next time. And I give you my sincere thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. We'll reschedule. Thank you.